Thank you, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. And thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Professor Sam, for both of you organizing this fantastic conference. I'm seeing some familiar faces. This is my second time here at the conference. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah? yeah? OK, great. So my name is Dr. Nazri. I'm here all the way from Malaysia. Um, I brought with me two Malaysian friends, my supporting uh, team, team behind me. Hello. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> and there's a lot of you here, not from UK as well. I hear some of you from Paris, France, um, Algeria, I don't know. Many of you coming from, all of, uh, from afar. Thank you for coming. I uh, appreciate your efforts. So, uh, and Slovakia, and Slovakia yeah. yes. Yes. Yes, Greece. 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 Fantastic. Netherlands. Netherlands. Wow. Italy. Germany, Italy. <laughs> Fantastic. Norway. Yeah. Norway. See? That's what I that's what I said. Right, right. <laughs> that's what Dr. Nazi do. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> so to uh, this just demonstrates to us how global Cocoon and ELO is. Yeah, by the way, in uh, Singapore, it's called ELO now. They've just decided to call it slightly, e not from your ELO. See, I can pronounce it ELO. <laughs> they wanted to <laughs> pronounce no, it ELO. 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 So now they're going to call it ELO. And then they're going to say, Hel say hello to ELO. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's their new tagline. So in Asia, <laughs> it's called ELO. Uh, it started maybe five years ago in Singapore, but in Malaysia, we only got uh, to know about it roughly maybe two years ago. So our experience with it has been very uh, limited in that sense. But what we're catching up, we're, we, I've been everywhere. I'm following Robert. I'm like uh, his fan. I'm going <laughs> traveling everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, just in this short period of two years, how I came to know about this, in the first instance, was through my patient. My patient was an Itali uh, a British, British Italian, and his father had colorectal cancer, stage four, and he didn't want to do the chemo, radio surgery, that bandwagon. He said he's already 76. He's uh, he doesn't want to go through all that suffering, and he he found out and sought out Dr. Roberts. Maybe through the internet, he found about cocoon in Hungary. And his son, who was my patient in Malaysia, asked me to contact Dr. Roberts then and ask what this treatment was all about and maybe find out a little bit more. So I did, and um, I, I told him, yes, please go ahead. Give yourself this next three months or so and see how you do. And to my amazement, within that three months of being treated with Dr. Robert and his bath and his suppositories and the water, he came back with all a clean bill of health, completely clear of his uh, colorectal stage four cancer. There was not even a trace of uh, any tumors left in his CT scans, and I was completely bowled over. And then another friend of mine, a good friend of mine, Dr. Said, uh, approached me and brought a bottle of water to my table one day, and he said, hey, listen, there's this special water. It's from Singapore, but the technology is from Hungary. I said, what water is that? I said, it's called Elo. And then that kicked me, and I said, OK, um, Hungary. I know a guy from Hungary. He, he <laughs> developed a, a kind of a technology and this special water. So I gave Dr. Robert a call, and it turns out that it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. I said, wow, this is amazing. I said, I must meet him. So we went down to Singapore to meet him, and that's how the story began. So obviously, all these medical disclaimers. I'm going to make it a bit lighter because those first three lectures this morning <laughs> was kind of a complex, huh? Yeah, so we're going to just look like at case history, make it a bit more uh, reachable, more personal to you. So I'm going to have a look at two patients of mine, um, friends as well, who had been drinking the water and it had provided them a benefit, a health benefit. The first case is uh, how it affected a coronary artery disease and fatty liver. This man had a coronary artery disease and fatty liver. And the second on how it affects uh, a case of heart failure, a patient with heart failure. 
and in uh, the third, a special significance to me, a, a friend of mine or a, an acquaintance of mine passed away, just died of a uh, maybe heart attack or something we don't know because he was in a movie, in a, in a, in a TV at that time and uh, somehow he collapsed. So maybe we'll go through a little bit of that. Um, and then a little bit of an explanation. Of course, there's always a little bit of science behind everything. And then um, whenever I mention hello, please just take it to be as it's also cocoon because in uh, the technology is the same, it's exactly the same water. So this patient, or a friend of mine, he himself is a doctor. In fact, he's a cardiac anesthetic, anesthetist. And he never had any medical problems in the past before and was always fine and he thought that he could be just fine. Then one day he complained of shortness of breath on, upon exertion and he had chest discomfort. He was um, bicycling at that time and then he left it for a while and then it started again and then was worried. And, but at that time, he already knew about Elo. He already knew about Takun. So, and since he also worked in a, in a heart institute where he was an anesthetist, he decided let's first do an investigation. We'll do a multiply CT <coughs> and then we'll do a perfusion scan <coughs> and have a look at the result and see what it was. So this is his baseline prior to starting any treatment. And you can see in this uh, multiply CT uh, so that he has uh, um, moderate mixed calcified atherosclerotic disease at the proximal segment of the left anterior descending artery, right? And he also has a mild calcification in the uh, left circumflex. Um, the right coronary artery also showed something mild, 25%. So this is his baseline. So in summary, moderate stenosis, which is blockage in the left anterior descending, this one, of about 50%, okay, and um, also in the left circumflex. Okay, then he did a nuclear scan, um, and it shows, uh, true enough, that there is an abnormal myocardial perfusion. Um, so there was a, a blockage, really, right, in simple words. So he decided, let's try out. Now, this is a good chance to try out just by drinking the water and see if there's any benefit. So he just he didn't start on any anti-aspirin or any anti-lipid. Anti he wanted to see if the water alone would do the trick. And he drank about 1.5 liters of the cocoon aloe water per day for three months and no other medication. And after three months, he repeated an angiogram. Because at that time, he noted that there was no more chest discomfort. He didn't have symptoms anymore. So this, is, this was his uh, angiogram. Uh, let's play it. Now it looks all much, much, much clearer that there was no blockages at all. If any of you could uh, interpret a coronary angiogram, if there was a blockage, you would see that there was a like a stenosis, a narrowing, right? But look, it's all clear. And on the impression, um, can you see the, the summary? Yeah. There was re literally, of course, the doctors and the um, angiogra and the radiographers, they're not going to say completely, oh, you've got nothing left, no? So they just say, oh, you've got a very mild uh, uh, disease left in the uh, mid left anterior descending, mild irreg irregularities in the mid uh, left circumflex. But basically, he was symptom free, and that's what he wanted. And the angiogram also proved that there was a marked difference from the previous um, uh, with, uh, investigation. So not only did he improve uh, in terms of his coronary symptoms, he also had uh, liver issues initially um, at about the same time. That happened in uh, November. So he was drinking from November till January. So you see, his alanine aminotransferase, a liver enzyme, was markedly raised. I mean, normal is below 30, below 40, and this guy is 123, and he thought he was like there was nothing wrong with himself. So he made, uh, his amazement, in November, his uh, aminotransferase 
was 123. But in January, after three months, it dropped to 96. And he continued drinking. And guess what? By March, which is another three months, it has reduced to four, less than 40. He's 37 right now. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So it's really <coughs> simple, <laughs> but effective. Huh? And we don't even have the bath yet. We don't have the bath. We have to go to Singapore to do the bath. Mm. So yes, in another patient of ours, a 44-year-old lady, uh, she was complaining of shortness of breath, poor, poor effort tolerance, has a history already of mild heart failure prior to this. Um, but uh, they, want, they wanted some alternatives. So in my country, where I'm practicing, I'm a functional and integrative medical doctor. So we try to stay away from conventional medicine uh, as much as possible, and we try to work with as much natural as possible. So they decided to come and have a look. And uh, this was their initial result. Okay, they did a, a cardiology report. So this lady, who's only 44 years old, has a history of diabetes mellitus in the first place, hypertension, uh, rheumatic, rheumatic fever at age 8, and has gallstones as well. And the most important thing here is that she has a diagnosis of non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy means your heart is dilated. It's just extraordinarily enlarged compared to what your normal heart size should be. And that would affect, of course, its pumping mechanism and its what we call ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is when how much of a uh, amount of blood that uh, upon contraction the, uh, the heart pumps out. So here she is at only 16% ejection fraction. Now normal should be above 60 for this age group. But 16%, come on, you're, of course you're going to be breathless, you're going to be tired all the time, and sooner or later your heart might fail. So um, no other thrombocene, no other pericardial fusion team, um, regional wall, uh, we called it, uh, it's, a, it's part of the wall, has a, a bit of a abnormality, movement abnormality. And hypokinesia means lack of movement. Remember I was telling to you, lack of contractility. When the heart is enlarged, the walls get thinner, and there's less uh, syno synchronicity for it to uh, pump uh, optimally. So, okay, you've got that point. Okay, so the conventional plan, what the normal doctors would put, of course, would put you on all these uh, antilipid, uh, blood thinners, uh, some bisoprolol, uh, a drug that can reduce your heart rate, um, some diuretics. But um, interestingly, interestingly enough, she wasn't on any anti-failure medication, which is something that can improve the heart contractility, something that increases the pumping mechanism of the heart happens to be that she wasn't on that, which is good for us because when we started her treatment, she's also on a restriction of fluid to only 500 cc's a day and on a low salt diet. So when we got her, we decided, okay, let's try out um, some uh, non-conventional therapy with aloe. And she drank about 500 meals a day. Well, actually, we tried to increase slightly higher, maybe 750 meals if you can. And she started in September 2018. And the next echo was in March 2019. So how many months is that? Six months? Guess what she is, came back with. So they assessed the left ventricular function by echogram. <coughs> Normal left atrium size. Normal left ventricular size. Normal right heart. Normal pulmonary artery. Normal pericardium. Normal, normal, normal. And guess how much the... Uh, left ventricular ejection fraction is 57% in just six months. Amazing, right? Yeah, and there she is at 44. You have a long lease of life. You need to go on with your life. You may have children and so on. So m imagine how much um, impact this does to your lifestyle, right? So now this was the film star I told you about. He's actually a very, very famous film star in uh, Asia, 
who comes from Hong Kong. He collapsed on film during a, fil- a reality TV show. But the thing about it is, we just met him. Robert and I, we just met him. Two, yeah, two, three nights beforehand at a fundraiser in Kuala Lumpur. And it was a shock to us because this guy was extremely fit. He was uh, young. Why should he just simply die? And turns out this reality show made you um, do all this strenuous exercise, or it's like a you know it's called catch me. You have to do exercises, and he was doing this for like 17 hours straight. So everyone was shocked and surprised. Yeah, this is the same hotel where we were at. Remember at our function? Yeah. So he was running, 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 and then on top of the stairs, he collapsed. Yeah. And they rushed him to the ER, but they could not resuscitate him. Oh, it's in one of them. Yeah. So this kind of kept me wondering, why didn't I talk to him about Elo that night? But it was too rushed. No one could have, yeah. you know, could have, no one could have predicted. Um, that's a same suit. Is there a relationship between hypoxia, which is low oxygenation, and heart failure and myocardial infarct? For sure there is, right? I'm also looking at a different tangent because earlier everyone was mentioning about the mitochondrial failure, which is what's inside your cell and uh, um, how lactic acidosis can uh, be produced when there is mitochondrial failure. So I tried to look at a bit down that tangent as well. and. Let's go briefly what lactic acidosis means. It means that when you have a pH of less than 7.35 due to a buildup in lactate, um, it's considered a distinct form of metabolic acidosis. This is the conventional view. When blood lactate is more than 4 millimoles, you are considered to be in lactic acidosis. And there's two types. The first type is when there is a decrease of oxygen perfusion to the tissue, where you have deficiencies in the, the uh, uptake. So maybe due to lung diseases, due to fluids in the lung, congestive heart disease like that lady earlier, shock, sepsis and anemia. Type B is when there is a direct increase in oxygen or metabolic problem, demand, sorry, and then you, it could not compensate, your cells could not compensate. So for example, he probably would have had a very much increased demand for oxygen, which he could not uh, commit to, which he could not uh, uh, produce. So you can actually collapse from this. Of course, the shim- symptoms initially would be shallow breathing, muscle pain, cramping, unusual tiredness, sleepiness, weakness, abdominal pain, ary- arrhythmia, which is irregular heart rhythm, <coughs> um, which could lead to even uh, in, uh, infarct and even a sudden MI, myocardial infarct, and coma. So how is uh, lactic acid formed? So everyone was talking about, I'm so happy that the, the initial two, three uh, lectures, they already mentioned about uh, aerobic glycolysis the, and the energetics of a cell and how um, the cell requires uh, from glucose to acetyl-CoA, which is, this is, this is a portion, is a 10-step portion where all the glucose is broken down step by step to this um, basic end product called acetyl-CoA. This is called the aerobic glycolysis in the presence of oxygen. And this is the basic ingredients that goes into the Krebs cycle, which is the TCA cycle. In the presence of oxygen, pyruvate dehydrogenase, the complex, brings in pyruvate into the mitochondria. And when it enters the mitochondria, it's converted to acetyl-CoA, and it enters the tricarboxylic acid cycle, the uh, Krebs cycle, and it's uh, to produce NADH and hydrogen ions to get into the electron transport chain and where the oxidative phosphorylation happens to produce energy called ATP. This is the most basic, most simplified uh, um, explanation. Cells need ATP, units of energy, for like Kulin said, for its energetics, for its repair, for its digestion and elimination. Without the ATP, the subunit of energy, the cells have no energy and it dies, right? Now, in, without the presence of oxygen, pyruvate tends to go towards lactate. See? 
structure via this enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase. Lactate itself, on its own, is not acidic, but via a few other mechanisms um, in the glycolytic process, hydrogen ions is also produced. So hydrogen ions are acidic. Now lactate, when its levels rises in this um, um, in the cytosol, which is in the, uh, it's in the cell, it can escape out, outside the cell, which is called the extracellular. And outside the cell is where it combines with a hydrogen ion and becomes acidic. And when the cells are based in an acidic environment, that's when all these negative things happen. Okay? There is an alternative explanation. This is something I just looked up in through the journals, just for completeness sake. But it does not change the fact that at the end of the day, it's due to mitochondrial failure that uh, your lactic acid accumulates. Okay? Everything works the same. Lactate is produced in the cytosol. Uh, it gets in during um, times of good oxygenation. It gets into the mitochondria, uh, converts to pyruvate, gets into the carboxylic acid cycle. In uh, an uh, aerobic environment, the lactate accumulates in the cytosol itself, which is outside the mitochondria, and then it escapes outside the cell, where it combines with the hydrogen ion, and as it increases, that's the uh, the basis of this acidosis. Okay, but remember, everything begins with the failure of the mitochondria. Okay, and this is the equation for you who those who really want to uh, to understand. So yeah, remember. Lactate is formed in the cytosol from pyruvate. It's, in fact, the action uh, favors lactate formation. This is regardless of whether you are in an aerobic or anaerobic environment. Lactate is formed either way. And at any time when the mitochondrial usage of pyruvate w uh, decreases, lactate will increase. And when does this happen? When uh, you have an exceptionally uh, need for excess energy, like when you're a marathon runner, or when you have a deficient in oxygen, and then the mitochondria cannot work, so the lactate increases. Lactate accumulates in the cytosol, <coughs> within the cell, but outside the mitochondrium, but it exports out. And it's through a, 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 this pin port, as it exports it out, uh, it's exchanged with an uh, hydroxyl ion comes in. So at lactate exporting out itself buffers the cytosol, because hydroxy, uh, component comes into the cytosol, combines with hydrogen to form water. However, when the lactate goes out extracellularly, it combines with hydrogen ion. This hydroxy and hydrogen was outside the cell. So as hydroxyl ion comes in, hydrogen is left behind, and that forms the lactic acid. In the breakdown of sugars, which is called glycolysis, that 10-step pathway that I mentioned earlier, the ATP is broken down to ADP during that process and it releases energy and hydrogen ions. See, So that's how the intracellular environment becomes more acidic. In a well-oxygenated condition, the ADP and substrate enters into the mitochondrial space and is converted back to ATP to energy. So you use up all the hydrogen ions within the mitochondria. So again, mitochondrial failure. If there is a state of hypoxia, mitochondrial failing, hydrogen increases. So why, if any, many, many studies, and I can uh, give you some references, whenever there is high lactate, it's a bad prognostic indicator. Yeah, it means that there is acidosis coming on the way. In the ST elevated myocardial infarct patients, it's a very bad indicator. So it makes sense to improve your mitochondrial function. So why is lactic acidosis so bad for the heart? Now, theories have come out to say that when your heart muscle is based in acid, remember, as the acid comes up, it becomes more lax. It becomes more lame, we call it. It cannot contract fully. Um, over a period of time, this causes a softening of the walls, and the walls can bulge. It's called a Barolbi, Barolbi uh, paradoxic. Okay. And it acts like a bouncy rubber, and it, um, because it's so elastic. So any blood that goes there, the oxygenated blood, it bounces it back off. So it becomes more and more hypoxic. So it's becoming more like a vicious cycle. 
eventually that cell wall, that part of the area, can undergo cell wall death or necrosis. And this is what term as myocardial infarct, cell death. So remember, um, those heart failure patients with um, dilated heart, they could have been in a lactic acid environment causing the walls to be softened and dilated as well, right? So, um, okay, so the areas of that wall are also akinetic. If it, if it has undergone cell death, of course it's akinetic. It, there's no movement anymore. So when uh, circulation tries to enter that area, it backs up, so it becomes a demeter. And at that same time, because of all that pressure, all the shearing happens, and thrombi formation can occur. So actually, most of the time, and research have shown this, a thrombus occurs after the infarct, after the cell wall death. So it's not the cause of it, but it can actually be associated. And we, we all only need one go, want to go on down that one line, that tangent that says, it's a thrombus that caused you to have a heart attack. So we go for antiplatelet treatment, all this antilipid treatment, but it's not. So that's one way to look at it. These are some of the references. So um, that was the hard part. Now we'll go to the easy part. There's, a, of course, to back this all up. Um, in Singapore, they have commissioned several studies. They, did, they do a lot of studies in Singapore and Asia. We sent mouse studies for can, uh, cancer cells. We sent some studies for um, uh, diabetes, etc. But in this study, we want to look at how uh, aloe or cocoon can reduce acidosis. So in this study, there was uh, a group of eight rats, four were uh, treated with uh, aloe water, given aloe water to drink, and four rats were just given tap water. And after seven days, all the rats underwent uh, an abdominal surgery and blood was let out. About 17% of blood was released to induce a state of shock. And then, then venous and the arterial blood sample was taken and an analysis was performed. So, so this is... the. <laughs> an image of the poor rats. I wasn't involved, so thank you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So one mil of the sample of the blood was taken, and it was analyzed. And look, lo and behold, the, the rats that was given aloe water, their oxygen partial pressure was still very high. It looks very, very high here because in humane conditions, we had to give them oxygen and isoflurane before we, you know, did the deed. So they are exceptionally high. But compared to the control, it's just one arrow. So that com tells you already that there was a background oxygen already in that bloodstream, pro probably from the aloe, right? Uh, and the carbon dioxide uh, uh, partial pressure is normalized, whereas in the control, it's very low. And that is a response, a normal response to metabolic acidosis. You get hyperventilation and your carbon dioxide is low. And look at the arterial lactate. This is the key take-home point. Normal in the ELO group, but very, very high in the control group, which is the normal tap water. Very, very high, with a, a statistically significant value of P0.001. Okay? And of course, your negative base excess, meaning you're, you're getting to, it, uh, to be acidic. I don't know why this is normal, it should be acidic. Um, so the arterial was normal because of the oxygen which we gave prior to the um, sacrifice. That venous oxygen saturation though was low. So take home point, carbon in the tap drinking water, you had uh, PCO2 low and high, high lactate. Um, and in the uh, aloe drinking water, the lactate is normal. So it helps to drink uh, aloe or cocoon prior to any heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Robert always mentioned, if you drink two weeks prior to any event, you probably will not have that event in the first place. Right? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, so it's not a miracle. It's not a medical water. It just reduces hypoxia. Thank you.